first year as a high school English teacher, public speaking and creative writing. When I'm not in the classroom, I, I love in, in interviewing wildly successful people like Amy and Brad and quite frankly, like many of you. Uh, you can find the podcast at 1% Better. That's O-N-E, percent better. Please email me if you need anything, if I could help you in any way. Uh, Brad, let's start with you. The first question is uh, both simple and complex Wait, by design. Uh, Brad, let's uh, through the first question. Uh, it, it's the idea of how, how are you? I mean, uh, we're, we're all here as educators, as parents, and we're wondering, how are you as someone who sees this from a distance? Uh, take that question any way you'd like. Um, I guess... I pay a lot of attention to the feedback I get from teachers around the country, really around the world, messages. And a lot of them are doing well, but some of them are hanging on by a thread. And that's the ones I try to really encourage. A lot of my tweets are geared towards that for the last few weeks. Um, I think we're in, people called it the new norm. And I'm like, no, let's, let's not call it the new norm. Let's call it what it is, which is just really trying to deal with chaos right now. And the thing that I try to encourage teachers the most is to uh, just take care of yourself first, take care of your family, and then do what you can for your students. This isn't the time to be superwoman or superman uh, because there's a lot going on and there's a lot of stress the teachers at home are dealing with a lot. I'm like, when you go to the store and you can't get toilet paper, <laughs> you know, we have other things that, um, you know, are more important right now. But for the teachers, why it makes it hard for me, my, myself personally, like you said, being a little distance from it, I, I'm doing well. It gives me time to really interact with more teachers right now, which I think is a great thing. I'll get, you know, you'll probably never see this message or, you know, I just wanted to share something. You don't have to respond, but fortunately I'm able to respond. Um, and I, I think that that makes me feel like I'm doing my part, I guess you would say, um, as far as reaching out to them, trying to respond with general tweets that really, you know, reach them, reach where they're at. You know, I know teachers are struggling. They're working way too many hours. They're feeling defeated. They feel like they're not doing enough when they see these wonderful online lessons, they feel like, you know, well, I can't do that. Or, you know, do I need to do that? And I'm just like, just, just be yourself. You have your strengths and your talents. Just focus on what you can do right now and know that that's enough. That's, that's strong stuff. There's no doubt about it. I will come back to a lot of that. Uh, Amy, how are you doing? Well, I um, ran out of my anxiety medication today, so that's the <laughs> indicator. Uh, I'm doing, I'm doing all right. You know, the the life of a high school principal is always a bit crazy, I guess. Um, this is, as you know, Joe, my first year as a high school principal. Um, my first year as a teacher was, uh, my first week of my first year was during 9-11, so I tend to like start a, uh, different career paths in crisis a little bit, I guess. But, um, you know, I was prior to this working long hours, supervising games late at night, um, but I think what's tricky about this is um, there is a blur between day and night and weekdays and weekends because you're at home and you're on your computer and so it's really hard to differentiate um, the work from other aspects of your life um, and I'm I find this week is the first year really kind of coming up for air a little bit I'm not doing nearly as well as Brad in terms of uh, being able to touch base with my teachers um, as much as I should be uh, right now I'm trying to uh, not only trying to figure out Oregon Department of Education's guidelines and how they're ever changing and what that means for our classes and grades and credit bearing opportunities, but also trying to plan for um, 
a different kind of graduation that's happening on June 5th. So I'm feeling for our teachers right now. Everyone uh, learning a new trade. Sort of, and the best parts of the job aren't really the parts we're focusing on anymore. I mean, we're trying to focus on them, but the, the work now is actually my least favorite part of the work, which is the to do the, the daily grind and it, the, you know, walking through the halls and talking to students and talking to staff um, that I'm missing. I would say anyone else, like, I used to dread chaperoning dances, and I would give anything to chaperone dance right now and just interact with our students and see them having fun. So um, I don't know if I'm cutting out or not. I that it's, it's usually I cut out when all the videos are all on on Zoom. So. Yeah, a little bit. What I'll recommend doing so, is, if you could aim to hit, hit I don't stop. want to cut anyone else's but it's usually the, all, the, all the videos happening at once to make my internet unstable. Yeah, I think if you go ahead and stop the video for you, Amy, and maybe audio only will reduce the bandwidth. I'll come back to you after I go back to Brad. So if you go stop video, I think you'll get more internet and we'll just see your name or your picture. Brad, something struck me when Amy was talking there. Um, she's in the, the building and your primary work right now, if I'm not mistaken, is as a writer. Do you see an advantage having been removed right now? Because so many of the people on the call today are in the trenches and you get a chance to kind of look down through that glass hole in the ceiling. I'm curious if you find advantages in that. Oh, absolutely. Because, you know, just like teaching in general is very isolative. So imagine now being removed from the classroom and they're sitting at home man, it's, it's isolation to the nth degree. And so it's like they're working with blinders on. So all, all they can see is what's happening to them. And yeah, I'm very fortunate to have this very wide angle view. A lot of the things I hear again are teachers feel like they miss their students. They feel like they're not doing enough. Should I be doing more? Although now they're working 10, 12 hours a day trying to do everything that their schools and districts are asking them to do, but they still don't feel like it's enough. And the reason they don't feel like it's enough is because they're missing that connection with the students. Because you can give them all the work, we can talk online, but teachers are all about relationships. And so when they're not in the classroom with, them, with their students or their kids, as they call them, interacting with them one-on-one -on -one in person, you just feel so disconnected. And so I think so many teachers just feel like they're in this tunnel or in this well, just isolated from everything. And so that's the reason that I really encourage them, you know, just focus on what you can do, do your best, but don't wear yourself out. Take care of yourself, take care of your family. You know, this is a time to talk about Maslow's bloom but it really is now especially when you think about it being in the middle of a pandemic you know can you get out and get food it, you know the shortage of toilet paper but then trying to do the work i think amy was talking about the hours going by and that's one of the things i try to mention to teachers is set a timer and get up two hours and three hours pass in the blink of an eye, especially when you're sitting. And I know that better than anyone when I sit and write for hours at a time. So I set my timer for 45 minutes or an hour. So I get up and move around and get, you know, moving and, and get active and get away from the screen. That's one of the things when they sit too long and you start getting the headaches because of your posture and the time flies by and you're just, you're almost stoked up, you've missed you know, meetings to meal or whatever. So those types of little things that hopefully are reminders to help them at least feel better in general physically, but also emotionally as well. Amy, uh, Brad mentioned connection. Now, we're, we're on the East Coast where, where I come from, but we can see through Twitter and through some of your social media profile, connection is one of your specialties. Uh, I know you're hurting with that way, but have you figured out any tricks of the trade for you or your teachers to be able to have a little more connection? Yeah, I don't know about any kind of tricks or 
DMX or um, I don't think I rolled out anything particularly cycle, but I would say that um, it's not surprising that in times of crisis, people come together. And let me know if um, you can't hear me very well, um, and I will stop talking and give the floor to Brad because he said some great things, and I don't want my internet to get in the way of that. Um, so far, but so, far so the good. The feedback that we overwhelmingly got from our department chairs. Oh, good. The, the, the feedback we overwhelmingly got from our department chairs and we met with them today was the irony that everyone is isolated at home by themselves and yet collaborating better than ever. This is really forcing uh, people to work um, in teams and learn from each other and lean on each other's strengths more than they ever have in the past when they're in the same physical location. So um, ironically, I would say our staff is coming together more than ever before. And part of that is due to um, the need that we all feel to be connected with each other because it is such a hard time. And part of that is just due to the amazing um, mentality of educators who um, always lean in when things get tough and work on, work with their uh, colleagues to, to grow and learn and lean on each other to gain new skills. So I think there have been some connections formed just among um, colleagues that didn't exist prior to this and some heavy stuff that people held on to in the building uh, for a long time that people are now realizing wasn't that important. And this, what this does, what all crises do is shine a light on what's most important. Um, and I think that's, that's happened in terms of what our purpose in education and a lot of what's most important purpose as well as what's the most important in terms of supporting each other and um, developing trust between colleagues on our, in our building. When, when things are going well, it's all too easy to get caught up in the nitty gritty and the stuff that doesn't really matter. Um, so I've, I've actually been um, super impressed with how our, our staff are coming together. And my, my weekly message to staff this week was all about cultivating joy. Because uh, it's real easy in this room of learning environment to just get in the weeds of the to-do list when, in fact, what our kids need right now and what we need right now is this sense of joy in our lives. And, and that, right, that I believe is um, the greatest purpose. And if we just keep, you know, rowing the boat in the direction of remote learning and kids are behind us drowning and, and we're not stopping the rowing to throw them a life back every now and then and show them that they're alive and their well-being was most important that I think we were kind of um, thrown in the wrong direction, so to speak. Brad, Amy writes a book called It's the, it's the Mission, Not the Mandates. And I'm curious, um, what is the mission right now? Because she spoke to that a little bit, but it, you know, from your perspective, I'm wondering, uh, we get lost in the weeds sometimes. So what, what is that actual mission right now? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I shared a, a quote that kind of went viral. I even heard a governor in his press conference, someone shared it. Um, it's called Relationships Before Rigor, Patience Before Programs, Grace Before Grades, and Love Before Lessons. And I think that's our mission right now. One of the things I like is that many states have suspended the standardized testing, which I think should be done indefinitely. Uh, and they have, a lot of them have suspended the, the formal teacher evaluations here at the end of the year. So my thought is, let's take the stress off the teachers. It really is less is more right now. We also have students that can't engage. You think of, of students that maybe don't have internet access, they may not have computers at home. They have two or three siblings at home trying to get online. So, you know, we, we are losing that engagement and teachers aren't responsible really for that. They can do their best, they can reach out, but you know, students can't participate, they can't participate. So that's one thing that the schools and the districts really need to keep at the forefront of their thought is that we really, less is more right now. The other thing is when you talk about the mission, what would we normally be doing right now? We would spend this month standardized testing, preparing, you know, we're, we're drilling them, we're getting them ready for 
test and we're doing the test. And we don't have to do that now. So we're kind of ahead of the curve anyway, when you think about the amount of learning that's, that has gone on. The other thing I think is while they're home, you know, I've always been the proponent of focus on students' strength and their talents, not their weaknesses, which is what we do in school. If they don't do well in math, that's what we focus on. But let's let them engage in things they like. Give, give them a broad topic and let them go with it. Let them build on their strengths and their talents. And they will get much more out of it than a worksheet or, you know, answer this question or fill in this. So I think, it, you know, the flexibility that we can have right now is so important. And that takes the pressure off the teachers to feel like they've got to create all of this content or whatever and, you know, really focus on just are my students okay? Am I able to make contact with them? Are their families okay? How are their parents doing? I get a lot of feedback from teachers that are talking about when they call the home, they're basically counseling the parent, you know, because the parent lost their job or, you know, something like that. So they're building this connection, which I think is probably the best thing to come out of this, is this should really strengthen the parent and teacher connection that hopefully will go forward into next year and we can build on that um, going forward. Brad, I want to come back to you for a second and ask you this. So you say let's lessen, for lack of a better word, let's, let's pull back on content. Let's double down on relationships. What's your message to the teacher who is a content aficionado? She is a wizard at chemistry or math or English. And she's, for lack of a better phrase, old school. And she has always said, if I'm a great content teacher, that would carry the day. Um, we still want to be compassionate to that teacher. What's the message? Hey, Mrs. So-and-so, now it's time to reinvent yourself, so to speak. What, what would you say to her? Well, I, it's funny. I actually sent out a tweet um, pretty recently that talked about communication. And the key to communication is frame of reference. If I'm talking to you and you don't know, you know, you mentioned Van Halen, somebody may not have got that, but I understood it because I have that frame of reference. So even though you're great at content, you still have to deliver it in a way that this, it's in the student's frame of reference. And that's with, with, you know, any level. So when we can do that, when we can, can deliver that content in a way that they understand it and connect with it and relate to it, then it means more to them. Just because I can give you a lot of statistics or data doesn't really mean a whole lot. And, and, and there's, that's great that teachers, you know, content obviously is a big important part of pedagogy. But I think that frame of reference of framing it in a way that we can connect it to their world or help them make connections that they can't make on their own to the real world with the content is still very important. Amy, you have a gift for connecting with students. What is the advice you give to the teacher who, you know, humbly comes to you and says, I'm struggling connecting, especially in a virtual world? Well, I don't know if I have a gift connecting to students, but I, I maybe have a gift of being painfully real, uh, which allows uh, students to maybe connect with me. I don't know. Um, but I, I would say we did, we have had that issue at the high school level. As you know, sometimes secondary teachers can um, have a lot of pressure to be very content driven as can elementary teachers actually but um, what we did say and what we would continue to say to teachers um, is that's fine but first call those students who are struggling to engage talk with the students talk with the families find out how they're doing find out what's getting in the way and inevitably, inevitably when that happens when teachers do that they can't help but have a new perspective going into their week you know it's at the high school level, it's really hard to make contact with families because you have 200 students sometimes and you're trying to um, teach maybe six different preps and figure out uh, your content for the week. And so this was a unique opportunity where we had a slow start in our district and said, this week we're not pushing on any content at all. Just make contact with um, your fourth period families. Everyone call your fourth period families, find out how they're doing, see what they need. Let us know what they need in terms of um, accessibility, how are they doing in terms of food, what can we do as a school district for them, and it was crazy how many high school staff came back 
and said, I had no idea what some of my students were going through. I had no idea how many of these families really did want to engage and help their students learn, but are struggling for one reason or another. So I don't think I need to say anything to our students or sorry, our staff to help them see the importance of connection with students and relationships as being the primary mission. I think all they have to do is take the time to reach out to families and it, they will, that will resonate so clearly, so deeply in their hearts that me saying something to them is secondary to what they will know after talking to their families. Brad, you had a tweet recently that I want to get right. You said, uh, some people are saying teachers are lucky to get a paycheck. Um, now this is empirical correct. Okay, we're all fortunate. Um, and yet it's a little bit troubling, especially for some of the people on the call that have either reverence or in the profession. So we're lucky to get a paycheck. But what are the people that say that? Uh, what are they missing? Um, a lot. <laughs> you know, teaching just by its nature has never really got the respect that it deserves. That's one of the reasons I'm such an outspoken advocate for teachers. I had a reporter actually message me the other day and she's like, you're so pro teacher, but you're not pro education. And I'm like, no, if you're pro teacher, you're pro education. Now there's people that are pro education that aren't necessarily pro teacher. And that's where we run into the problem because you know, teachers, when they, you're lucky to get a paycheck, well, they don't realize how many hours teachers put in. You know, when teachers work 80 hours a week during the year, I don't hear anyone going, man, you should make extra for that. So it's always almost to the negative that you should be lucky. But, you know, they're professionals. Uh-oh. We lost Brad, but we're ready for all kind of chaos. That's, uh, I love it. It, mir <laughs> it mirrors where we're at, Amy. Uh, Brad's coming to us from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, so we might have some people there in the chat from Atlanta. Amy, I'll go right back to you on this. Uh, I'm going to ask Brad in a minute about one of his most controversial ideas. Maybe it's not. Maybe I made that up. But he says, and let me go to my notes. He says, you know, when you're a teacher, the students come first. That's obvious. And everyone's been trained to know that. But his philosophy is if you're an administrator, the teachers come first. Uh, I wonder what your thoughts, having been on both sides of the aisle, what are your thoughts on that? And then we'll ask Brad when he rejoins us. Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to agree. That's how I feel like I try to live um, my role as principal and previously as assistant principal. And it's not that you're putting anyone in front of anyone else. Like, I think some people interpret that as if you're there to please teachers and you're putting the adults in front of the students. And that's not it at all. I think anyone who's read any of Simon Sinek's work knows the importance of caring uh, for those you serve. And that is not only modeling for teachers, the kind of care we give students, but that's really secondary to the fact that teachers deserve that care. Like it's not just a means to an end, like I'm gonna care for the teachers so that they in turn will care for the students, but our educators, um, they work hard. They have one of the most noble professions on the earth. Um, they're sometimes tasked with an impossible job and they deserve for someone to care for them, watch out for them, support them. Uh, so I, I agree wholeheartedly with Brad um, on that. And I do think in the end that does serve our students um, better as well. So it's a win-win in terms of, it, it's ridiculous for any leader to think they have to choose between serving their staff and serving their students, in my opinion. Amy, uh, when people look at your social media profile, um, I misspoke earlier when I said you have a gift for connection. To me, I don't use the word gift too often. I, I think it's a skill, it's a, it's a practice skill you have, a lot of the people on the call have. Uh, but when we look at you and we look at your tweets and we look at your book and we look at McMinnville and we're saying, hey, this is looking great. Uh, true or false, everything is going perfect in the Pacific Northwest as in Amy Fast's life. <laughs> no, no. But, you know, the beauty is never in the perfect, right, Joe? The beauty is <laughs> typically in the, in the pain and the, the rub between where you want to go and where you're hope, what you're hoping for and and where you are and what you're striving to be. So no, definitely not perfect, but amazing, yes. Give, give us a sample day. I don't wanna say a typical day. I wanna say a sample day. So what's either today or a day you can vividly remember? Give us as best you can uh, an idea because people on the call right now are saying, well, I, I took a walk today. Am I supposed to feel guilty about that? Oh geez, yeah, a sample day for remote learning? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I'm thinking back to, 
it's been kind of, it's been, well, not just kind of, it's very much been emotional whiplash. And I think I saw an article on social media recently that talked about almost, it was similar to the stages of grief, just what teachers are dealing with. And when I think about educators, like I've been living this cycle of school since I was five. I'm 40 years old. And there's this kind of predictability that comes with, okay, it's prom season now. We all go to prom. Like I've been going to prom for way too many years in my life, right? Because I'm a high school administrator now. And so I'm mourning the things that I almost, I almost uh, thought we should be reevaluated about traditional school in the same way someone would mourn if they didn't get to spend Thanksgiving, you know, tradition with their family like they typically would or Christmas tradition. So um, for me, I'm thinking about a typical day was when we spent uh, the day in back-to-back -back Zoom meetings from 7.30 a.m. to 7.30 at night trying to figure out how to uh, create what remote, uh, remote learning looks like in McMinnville School District. And I just went to bed um, exhausted. I was cranky at my family. Stayed up late trying to figure it all out. I had this product we were really proud of. And then I wake up to 29 texts that all were linked to the Oregon Department of Education saying, basically, just kidding, we're not doing it this way anymore, we're going to do it this way. And so it was back to the drawing board. So almost all of my weeks until this week have been some sort of whiplash, where you think you have a plan in place, and then you have to go back to the drawing board. And what's hard for me is I'm, I'm pretty ADHD, and I love being a high school administrator because I get to talk to people all day and roam the building and, you know, be in music one period and drama the next period and math the next period and so it really caters to my need for constant stimulus and now I find myself sitting for ungodly hours in a row on my computer and like I said the day blurs tonight the weeks blur into the weekends and I find myself struggling to be a good parent right now honestly I have a fifth grader and a sixth grader and I'd be lying if I told you I knew where they were at in terms of their progress on remote learning so I'm not being the kind of parent that I hope the parents of our students would be. And that's really hard for me to reconcile every morning that I wake up and yet the to-do list still looms. So a typical day for me is a lot of meetings that are remote now, a lot of projects that need to get done. And like I said before, when my internet was cutting out, it's, it's all the least favorite work um, that has existed in my job. And now that's the bulk of the work is the to-dos and the computer work and the sitting in a chair in front of a laptop. Wow. And before Brad's uh, internet started to mirror the situation that we're all in, right? Inconsistency, unpredictability, uncharted territory. He was uh, talking about compassion. And I hear you as someone who demands a lot of herself saying you're not the parent or, or educator you want to be right now. So what do we tell people that are, that are with us tonight? What do we say? Um, we don't want to say it's okay, whatever you do. We're, these are high achieving, amazing teachers. But what's, what's the message? Like, is it do the best you can and that's it, go to sleep at night? What, what do you say when, I know it's a hard question. Yeah, I think the message is interesting because the message now is, should be the message we always give educators, which is um, we need to focus a little less on our practices, our systems and our structures for a sec and just remember like, what is the ultimate mission? And, you know, I have my own theory about what the purpose of school should be. Uh, but usually when we come back to that purpose, it becomes much more clear in terms of the direction we should take on any given day. And so I've talked before to you about how my, what I believe is the purpose of school is that intersection between academic achievement, those foundational or soft skills and a student's intrinsic drive. And that's, that's really at the sweet spot of, um, you know, where we want our kids to be in terms of their learning and public education. And I don't think that's any different right now, honestly, like as, if an educator can step back and say, how can I most leverage my students' well-being, their desire to learn, and, and their, uh, their most essential academic skills right now, what could I do to leverage those in the time that I have so that I can still be the parent that I need to be, that I want for my own students in my own classroom? I think that's, if we ask ourselves that question, the answer almost always will surface and be much more clear to us as a result. 
If you're joining late, we appreciate it so much. I'm um, Joe. This is an idea that I had and I put together and shipped because I knew Amy and Brad had a lot to say. And while Brad was with us, he gave us a lot of perspective. In a few minutes, I am going to open this up to some questions. We have a great group of educators and parents here. So we'll have some questions for you, Amy. Uh, I've been doing a podcast every week since July 1st, 2017. Once in a while, you strike gold, have an educator or a person like Amy on episode 54. And then you get to talk about a lot of different things. I heard relationships before rigor. Um, it's interesting, Amy, because right now, I would argue it's easier to ask for rigor, right? Give busy work, uh, give a lot of hard things. Building relationships is pretty challenging right now. What do you say to that? You know, I, I don't, I, it's hard for me because I'm in my own little, uh, tunnel of the way Oregon's doing remote learning. So I don't know how the rest of the country um, has fallen um, into, into line in terms of where they're at. But with our pass, no pass model that we have right now, and we've got sufficiency, proficiency criteria that are much different than our traditional grade. When you take the grade pressure off of both students and teachers, when you take the homework pressure off both students and teacher, it's amazing the kind of relationships that can be built even in a remote setting. The feedback I got from teachers today, I got, I received essays from teachers of students that refused to do work in a traditional setting that were, um, that were really vulnerably written about things happening in their lives. I heard from a teacher, a student who was pretty shy and never talked in traditional class is pretty much a class clown and hilarious on Zoom meetings. Um, so teachers are, starting to see aspects of their students and that they didn't necessarily see in a traditional setting. And I think it's really, it's really a time for teachers to, to try to see their students, which I know sounds super ironic because we're literally like in our own houses, not seeing each other. But I think that we have this ability to some, somehow see them now more than ever. And that's because we have those pressures removed, some of us, um, of traditional grading of traditional schedules. And it, I have my, my daughter's teacher, she's, she's got some anxiety issues of her own and she was kind of in over her head with this remote learning stuff and with a mom who's struggling to help her because I'm working so many hours a day and her language arts teacher showed up today at my house and took a walk with her just to kind of talk her off the ledge and let her know that everything's okay and that she believes in her and that she's there to help. And you know, that, that would have never, she would have never been able to make time for that in a school day. I mean, she would have been able to pull her outside and have a, outside the classroom and have a quick conversation. But to, to the, some of the things that teachers are getting permission to do in lieu of um, the rigorous content that they're pushing out um, is, is going to set the stage for um, changing the way we look at how teachers build relationships in the future. And I'm not, I'm in no way saying that teachers should be driving to students' houses and trying to build connections. What I'm saying is when you remove those constraints and those barriers, let teachers come up with the ways in which they're, they need to be there for their students. Let students tell those teachers and they will surprise you. We try to systematize everything, sometimes at the expense of those relationships. And I'm, I'm saying that when sometimes when we remove that system, we can see those, those great practices surface. And then, then we're allowed to kind of rethink the system that we're in. If you're joining us late, uh, Brad Johnson was sacrificial lamb tonight. <laughs> he, uh, he took his internet out to show us how inconsistent life can be. And we appreciate that, Brad. In a few moments, we are going to ask the audience questions. A few are coming in the chat. Feel free to jump in there. Amy's been generous with her time. Amy, I want to ask you about attendance. Uh, uh, a Twitter friend and coach that I admire uh, had a quote that I want to use and say, attendance does not imply consent. It doesn't imply interest in learning. It's just attendance. It's a body in a seat. I really feel like now is the, is the fulcrum where we could begin to look at what attendance means and what it'll mean going forward. If I throw the word attendance at you, um, what do you think about it and how should we start to look at it as, as education present and future takes place? Oh man, that's such a great question, Joe. Uh, when, I, when I think of attendance, I can't help but think of compulsory education laws. And like you said, a butt and a seat. Um, and attendance is, um, you know, we can think of it as physically being present or we can think of it as being engaged in learning. And what's fascinating now that we have, when I talked about removing some of the constraints and some of the systems, 
it doesn't necessarily mean that teachers are going to do worse work. So we remove these attendance, like ADM, average daily membership in our district. We remove, um, you know, the compulsory education laws, remove the attendance taking in um, in their e-school system. And, and what's, what's amazing is we have a school of 2,200 students. We only have 25 students right now who have not been accounted for in one way or another, and we're doing home visits for them um, right now. So now, 25, I'm sorry to jump in, 25 students, but your population is different than a lot of people on the, on the Zoom tonight. How big is your population? So we have 2,200 students. We have a high poverty school, about 60% on free and reduced lunch. Incredible. Um, Go, on. Go ahead. So, so it's, it's not, I mean, 25 students unaccounted for is too many, but it's not bad in terms of the fact that we've only been in this remote learning. This is week three, so two full weeks. Um, so I think um, but. What's interesting is when you start looking at attendance in terms of engagement and who's actually thriving in school and not just sitting their butt in a seat in school, um, it does change the game a little bit. And um, it's, been, it's been really cool to see the outreach that's happened from our staff to when we've um, you know, tried to gather names of kids who haven't been engaged in the learning so far, far and that, that includes uh, social distance appropriate home visits, that includes um, calling families, and I would say they're being called at a rate and reached out to at a rate that is greater than what would typically happen in a traditional school day. Um, and those calls are much more empathetic and problem solving than just, I just want you to know your student has missed two weeks of my class, um, you know, and, and the expectation being on the parent to then um, enact some sort of consequence. So I think that we have a lot to learn in terms of attendance from this experience. Um, I don't know what that is necessarily, but I do know that um, it's another example of when you take the system out, when you, when you pull that rug out from under um, the, the educators, that they, they don't do worse work. They actually are in some ways doing better work. Yeah. You know, one question I would throw out to the group with no expectation of an answer is, uh, what is it that attendance means? We can take our role, we can go down alphabetically, but, but what does it mean, right? It doesn't mean that the student is there to learn. And I know some people tonight on the event uh, can feel strongly about that. I want to go to a Cruz with a question. Great question. Uh, she's a family liaison, and the question is, what advice can you give for teachers who are not buying in to this new type of learning and instruction? Uh, he, she's hearing things like a lot of us, amazing new technologies being used new formats, new engagement, choice involved. For the teacher who's not buying in, Amy, it starts to talk about one of your favorite words in school building and culture. So uh, I'll let you run with that. W what, what's your message? You, you're an administrator. You want to empower teachers. Right. I mean, I think I, the, what works for our school is just highlighting the greatness that's out there and being empathetic um, about the learning that still needs to happen. So every week, um, you know, we try to we try to highlight the amazing failing forward that teachers are doing, and I think that's that's so important because if we're just highlighting the successes that are happening with remote learning, if I'm a teacher who's never even started a Google Classroom, I could be super overwhelmed and just not even want to try. It. Just like a lot of our students are feeling right now, like I'm I'm three weeks behind in my classes. What's the point of even trying? I, and teachers, we we sometimes forget that they their minds operate similar similarly to their students as do ours. So. If you put yourself in that, in that role of what, it, what it's like when you're trying to learn something new, celebrating the failures is as important, if not more important, than celebrating the successes. So highlighting those who are trying new things, um, I think, is crucial for the role of a leader. And I see that Brad's back on here, so I definitely want to give him the opportunity to answer that question, too. Brad, I want to, just cut, I want to set the record straight. To get rid of this rumor that you took uh, a moment or two to go to Cut Steakhouse in Atlanta for, take, for takeout. <laughs> is that true? I wouldn't be back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I just wanted to make sure. So Brad, we're going to catch you up with one question right off the bat, which is this, um, the teacher who's not buying into the new fangled approach. Uh, when I say new fangled, it's really the wrong terminology. What I mean is uh, relationships over rigor. Uh, if you were an administrator and you've advised many, what would your message be to try to tell teachers it's okay if you want to be yourself, but we also need you to bend a little bit. Well, because it, it, it is a different environment right now. Like I said earlier, 
unless all of your students have access to be in your classroom on time when you need them to, you got to have some grace. Um, think of the students again, like I said, if you've got three or four children and they're all expected to be in their classrooms at a certain time and you only have one computer, and maybe the parent even needs that computer while they're home. So it's just, it's unrealistic right now to think of, of education in that sense of, oh, we got to do more. We got to go harder. We got to be rigorous. I mean, it's, it's, it's not logical. It, it's in direct, you know, contradiction to everything else really that's going on right now. Like I said, when you can't go to the store and get toilet paper, obviously there's other things that are more important right now. So I don't mean forever, but, but, but even then, my thing with rigor and the reason I used it specifically is because when people tell me that, I, I hate educational bud, buzzwords like fidelity and rigor because I'm like, what does that mean? Because it's gonna mean something different to you than it does me. So, you know, there's no real, measuring stick for that. So, you know, have a little grace with that. Again, if your students aren't coming, they can't show up, they can't do the work, who, what does it matter how rigorous that it really is anyway? And all you're doing is just getting them further behind. Like I said, right now, because we're not having to do the standardized testing, et cetera, we really do kind of have that built-in window. And to me, like I said, education at the end of the day, comes from the word educare, which means pulling out of. So like you're pulling out the talents and strengths of students. So like I said, let, let them do that at home. Let them focus on their passions, their strengths. Give them some ideas and let them run with it on their own. Never will they have that freedom again to really learn in, in that manner. And it gives the parents a little freedom so that they don't feel like they have to sit down and do the work with their students or do the work for them. Right now, work at home is very similar to us sending home homework. And to me, you know, elementary students right now should not be doing more than probably 30 minutes to an hour of work at most. They should be playing, they should be, you know, doing, interacting with home with the families, with the parents, let do things with them. You know, learning is more than just a book, a textbook, or even a standard. We're living history right now with this pandemic. Let them feel it, let them breathe it, let them experience it, let them learn through it and from it as well. Brad, can you repeat that number you gave an estimate of how much time should be doing? Oh, elementary, they should not be spending more than probably an hour, hour and a half at the very most. Kindergarten, first grade, second grade, give them 30 minutes of work and, and, and be done with it. What about an 11th grade student, Brad, who is an AP caliber student, who actually could be in the rare minority here, um, dying for more challenge yeah, because we've been asked to kind of dial it back. Would you, would you be open to completely differentiating his or her uh, experience? Well, I think there's so many like apps and, and different like programs like Study Island. And I know that may not fit for an 11th grader, but I'm like, if parents really want more, let them do a little digging or offer them some options like Study Island, for example, where the student can get on and do activities for hours at a time. Um, you know, a lot of the high school students, I, I joked with teachers and said, you know, they, you may not even know if they're alive right now because they're not coming to class. So, you know, get on Minecraft or Fortnite or Halo and you'll probably find them there just to know they're alive. Um, but yeah, I get that, you know, the AP students or whatever, if they offer them more options, but to me, again, now's not the time to try and, you know, be the, you know, offer the most, or again, the rigor, the whole rigor thing really just right now, there's just so much going on that, you know, it just seems so disjointed with, with reality right now. One person, uh, Monica, asked a question about um, looking forward to the fall. Um, I, I say looking forward, but she's basically asking about, there's a possibility things will be different in the fall. So I'm going to just amend her question slightly for the good of the group, and which is to ask this. You've traveled all around the world, training teachers, working with them, empowering them. Is there anything that you used to teach or recommend that still applies today in, in big time form? 
Um, research that was done a few years ago, actually here in Georgia, but it's kind of been mimicked all over the world, is that the number one predictor of student success in a classroom is the relationship with the teacher. And that overrides even like their home life, their socioeconomic, et cetera. When you have a teacher that believes in you and, and really, it's the Pygmalion effect. Um, I don't, that's not discussed enough in education, I think. But basically what it says, and I actually write about it in, in my, uh, I have a book coming out called Principal Boot Camp. And basically what it says is that when you have someone that you think can be very successful, uh, they tend to live up to that. So when you have high expectations for students, and the catch here though is that when you have high expectations for someone, you tend to give more to helping them be successful. So think of the leader, the leader like with the teacher that, okay, this is a great teacher, I think they're gonna do well. Well, that leader tends to be a better leader to them. So it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy, not only because you're creating an environment of high expectations that they wanna live up to, but you actually do a better job of leading them. The other thing is with that, is that with that relationship, it's just like with your, your own children, they wanna please you if they have that good connection and that good relationship with you. So students will always work harder, typically, you know, there's always the outliers, but, but, but typically students will work better for teachers they like than for teachers that they don't like. So at the end of the day, and we know that the reality is that learning really is relational. It, you know, we have the content, we have the pedagogy, we have the curriculum, we have the technology. But man, when you don't have the relationship, it's a struggle. And our teachers are experiencing that right now, being so distant from their students. Great stuff coming in in the chat. I love the questions. It's at Dr. Dr. Brad Johnson on Twitter. Tremendous follow. Empowering a lot of us out there right now. Amy, I want to go to you. An early question came in from Drew Carter. Uh, he says, MAC High has an incredible culture. What's the secret? And I just want to throw in there, I know you've been humble. It appears to me that culture... Uh, is most important in times like now. Because if you've really done your work and built the culture, it'll have to stand up now when it's total chaos. Sure, I think there's, there's two things that make our culture so special. And we do hear that a lot from people who come into our school. You know, like I said, we're a high poverty school. Um, we, we beat the odds statistically every year. We're, um, we're, we, make, we make national news in terms of performance. So I attribute all of that to our school culture and the resilience of our students. But I think there's, there's two main things. One is to have a very uh, clear and very noble purpose for why we're all there. And at our school, um, it might sound cheesy, but we live every day our mission statement, which is ignite passion, pursue purpose, write your worth. And that's for students and staff alike. And everything we do is through that filter. It, say, those, ignite, say those again, please. Ignite passion pursue purpose, rise to your worth. Every single thing we do, we put through that lens of are we igniting passion? Are we pursuing purpose? Are we rising to our worth and helping students rise to their worth? And if we're not meeting those three criteria, we don't do it. And so that's, that's number one, how we build culture. And then I think number two is um, the importance of storytelling. And you're, you're a speech teacher, Joe, so I think you could, this might resonate with you, but there's, it's true that, um, you know, who we are as a school becomes the story that people tell about us. But it's also true that the story we tell about our school becomes who we are. And so we fight hard to tell a story of resilience, a story of hope, a story of greatness every single day. And I think that we, we fight so hard for that that we've actually become that over the years. And so it sounds touchy-feely, I know, but really I attribute our culture to those, those two things as having a really strong and noble and clear why, and then making sure that the story we're telling about ourselves is who we want to become in the end. Good time to mention that we have a uh, unpaid world-class note taker on the call. Uh, Zach Casto later will be putting these together. I didn't even ask him. I know he's doing it. I know his pen probably ran out of ink on that one, Amy. That's fantastic. Sandro asked a related question, and he says, the world uh, has paused and has given us some gifts in his view, our personal lives nightly family dinners that some administrators like yourself haven't seen more time inward 
Um, it calls to mind the really powerful question I've asked often. Um, what does this make possible? Um, are, are you, and I'm going to go to Brad, same question, Amy, then Brad, are you guys seeing any positives on the professional side from remote teaching? I'm, I'm seeing a ton of positives. Like I said, the increased collaboration, ironically enough, is a huge positive. The ability to get rid of some of the constraints um, and the parameters and just focus on the mission, because sometimes the mission gets skewed when you are always focusing on the task and the parameters. Those are two huge positives. Um, the ability to blend your professional and personal life. I think while I have not yet found success in that, I am determined to. I want to get to the place where it's not work and it's home, but there's this, you know, this, this blend between the two and who I am as a principal and who I am as a mom and a wife carries over into both realms of my life. So I think there's a ton of positives. I think the, 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 the piece for us is to not sit and wait for normal to happen to return to joy, but it's to try to find the joy now in what we're doing and try to find the beauty in what we're doing. And then inevitably when we um, start um, lifting some of these restrictions on society, we will um, hopefully take time to reflect and take some of what we've learned with us. Um, Brad, same question, positives? Can I, before that, you mentioned that Amy is probably too humble to answer her question, which she was. Um, the culture there begins with leadership. And when you hear her talk, you understand that she has the leadership perspective, servant leadership really is what creates a great school culture. It does begin with, with her when you hear her talk about her staff and her students. And you know, that shouldn't be glossed over because that's the cornerstone. She takes care of her teachers. She puts them first. She treats them professionally. She gets input from them. And that is what creates that culture where they want to go above and beyond for her. You know, when she takes care of them, you know that they're going to take care of the students. And that's something that's missing in a lot of schools is that servant type leadership where they really do. You know, I tell leaders all the time, you can bring two things. You bring your assets or you bring your agenda. And your agenda is where you're wanting to build yourself up and move to the next level. When you bring your assets, that is you willing to pour out what you have to help your teachers be better. And that's what I get from Amy. You know, I say I can walk in a school and within two or three minutes, I can tell the culture of a school. And when you hear her talk about her teachers and her school, you know that that's what you would find there. Wow. And I forgot your question. <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't even care about my question anymore. I care about this. <laughs> Tell the people on the call without mentioning any names, obviously. What do you mean you see it in two to three minutes? This is what everyone wants to hear. You're walking in. Is it, is it the greeting? Do you have to have fresh baked cookies like they do in the corporate world of the best companies, Dave Ramsey and others? Tell me about that. I'm going to be quiet. Tell us how we can feel it in two minutes. Okay, so you walk in. It's the buzz in the office, it's the interaction, it's the conversation, it's how the principal or the assistant principal, the administrators interact with their staff, not just their teachers, not just their students, but their staff. Um, I heard his name was Chester Elton. He wrote a book called The Carrot Principle. He's a friend of mine. Um, we, we converse regularly. He said that um, in Hard Rock Cafe, he, when you go in, he said he went into one and the dishwasher was back there washing dishes, but they were dancing and singing. And his philosophy is if the dishwasher's happy, everybody's happy. And so when you walk into a school and you see the staff is happy working there, then you know you have a good leader. When you see the teachers in the hall, what their conversations are about, how they interact with the students, all those relationships, that, that, that culture, that climate is, is palpable. You can feel it when you walk in. Wow. Underrated Buffalo wings at the Hard Rock Cafe. I want to, <laughs> I want to say that as well. Uh, there's a lot of good things happening in the chat, including Zach mentioning um, his notes. And I love Janelle um, addressing Sandro's question. There's a lot of educators in this room. I just happen to think that Brad and Amy on a call would be amazing. And you guys are obviously bringing a tremendous amount to it. As we kind of begin to wind down here um, back to you, Amy, um, do you have a secret or two um, that, that, that does show up in culture uh, these days? 
in remote learning. Yeah. Oh, gosh, I knew you'd put me on the spot with that, Joe. Man, I, you know, I, I don't know if it's a secret because I think Brad has spoken to it and I appreciate the kind words, Brad, but it's really about seeing our staff and seeing the hard work that they're putting into what they're doing. And when I say hard, I don't mean just seeing the people that are doing it, quote unquote, right, but seeing the, I've got, I've got a few teachers in my social studies department, bless their hearts, they're amazing. And I don't think they've used a computer for teaching, um, you know, and, and ever. Um, and they're, they're phenomenal teachers. They're retiring at the end of this year. And they literally leaned into this remote learning the last two months of their career, created Google Classrooms, they're doing screencasts, doing Zooms. And even if they weren't, it's just acknowledging um, what everyone is dealing with right now. And I think whatever you can do to continue that personal connection with your staff and help them feel seen during this time, help them feel validated that this is not easy, like Brad said, this is super hard and help them um, have permission to actually live the mission, which Brad is right. It's all about relationships right now. It's, it's interesting how many staff put pressure on themselves and I don't know where it comes from because I'm not putting it on them, but you know, systematically over dozens of years, we've been conditioned, conditioned as educators to feel like we're doing something wrong and it's not going to be good enough for the state, and the scores aren't going to look good enough, and the results are going to be fine. And I think that that's almost like PTSD right now for a lot of people, and they're worried they're doing it wrong. And so our job as, uh, as leaders, as administrators, is to say, I see you. You're, you're, don't worry. You've got this. How can I help? How can I support you? And just to continue to tell the story of their greatness as well. So it's not a secret, Joe. Um, it's what exactly what Brad talked about, but it is the work. And I think sometimes as leaders, we can get so in the weeds with all the tasks that we make the mistake of putting the work before the people and the work is the people. And I, I think, you know, even in remote learning, if you can uh, maintain that, um, that motto as a leader that the, the work is in the interaction with the people, then everything's going to be okay. At Fast Crayon, uh, that's Amy Fast. Um, earlier, Chris uh, Cooper mentioned uh, a Peter DeWitt's blog about why students don't show up for remote learning. Confess, I haven't read it yet. Perhaps Chris can link it or you guys can Google that. It's an interesting thing. I'm, I'm imagining it has a lot to do with purpose and expectations. And then D Story, who was kind about my voice, we, we always want to acknowledge that. But uh, I like the question for Brad. If we could change or integrate into the new world education, what would you want it to look like? And I think his question is in the spirit, uh, his or her question is in the spirit of, we were thrust into this, Brad. So there's no realistic expectation that we were ready. But now we got to take something from it. What do we take into the new world, Brad? Um, that teachers are professional. They don't need to be micromanaged. Uh, you know, I love how Amy talks about she doesn't throw expectations on them, but a lot of them do. Uh, unfortunately, when we hear of, you, you know, I find it odd that some administrators, and I'm not trying to be judgmental, but if they're not in the classroom during the year, why on earth are they going into a virtual classroom now? Because that's just adding more pressure to teachers that they really don't need. Um, you know, so it really is about, you know, stepping back and giving them autonomy and we see what teachers can do. And here's the big takeaway. Um, well, two things. First, when you talked about what's different with the teachers. It, yeah, I, I ramble. So <laughs> the young teachers are able to step up and help veteran teachers now when we think of like the lessons, the Zoom and stuff. So that that kind of shifts a little bit. But that's great in leadership. I tell leaders all the time. You should have mentors, you should have people you connect with, but make sure some of them are younger so that you're speaking to the younger generation, you're connecting with them. You know, in education, if you think about it, we have five generations of teachers potentially in the classroom. And so they have different uh, visions, they have different incentives, they have different motivations. And so it's good to learn their language and how to connect with them. So we see younger teachers may be able to step up and help older teachers right now with some of the technology and things, and that's that collaborating that Amy was talking about. Going forward, we've always said, oh, we need the standardized test to see if the students, how they're doing, which we know is really not a good way to, 
uh, measure that. And also that, oh, we need them for teacher evaluation too. You know, otherwise they're not gonna do their work. So now we've suspended standardized tests and evaluations and we see teachers working even harder than ever before. So let's trust going forward that maybe we don't need to focus so much about standardized tests and let's give teachers a little more autonomy to, you know, I say all the time, teachers know what their students need more than anybody else in the classroom. They're the expert, give them some autonomy to reach them where they're at. And so I would love to see that going forward. I always bring up Finland and I get pushed back from people, but in Finland, they have no standardized test in elementary or middle school. And so when they do the standardized test in high school, they blow everybody away. And I understand we have a difference in, you know, the size of our countries and, and student populations, et cetera. But I think there's something there with that pressure, with that unrealistic, unrealistic pressure and just, you know, the, the focus on testing that gets us away from learning. I heard one teacher say, I'm finally getting to be a teacher, not a tester for this next six weeks. And I think that's very powerful if you think about it, that it changes the perspective. So I would love to see teachers, you know, with a little more autonomy, able to really connect with their students. And let's take a little bit of the pressure off of treating teachers like children. They're so often treated like students, you know, how they're managed, how we evaluate them, on and on and on. And, and even that is kind of backwards. I share all the time, we hire teachers for their strengths, and this is something he'll, he'll want to take down in his notes. <laughs> but we hire teachers for their strengths, but then we immediately begin to manage them based on their weaknesses. And that's the culture that we do with students. You're great at something, but you're poor at something, let's focus on that instead of helping them really be successful. With teachers, we need to do that too. What are their strengths? Well, let's develop them where they are really, you know, exponentially more successful. And I would love to see that going forward. So much good stuff there. We are at the 63 minute mark. Uh, so I'm going to say this, uh, Chris Cassidy in the chat for Brad and for Amy asks the single best question I've heard this week. And I'm going to read it and then give you guys, Amy and Brad, a few moments to think about your answer. He says, if we were going to develop a public service announcement for parents and student expectations of education, what would it say? And I, I'm gonna just zoom that in. Let's talk to parents because we are parents, a lot of us. Let's focus that question. It's a wonderful question. Think about what your message would be. You have the soapbox as my wife is creating a project now and you're gonna talk to parents. Now, we'll give you a second to think about that and say this. Uh, in a few moments, I'm gonna unmute some mics for people that wanna have their voice heard for Brad or Amy. I want to thank all 42 of you for being here. It means an awful lot. Um, the idea about job interviews that Brad brought up, strengths and weaknesses, is highlighted in Adam Grant's uh, recent podcast called Work Life. So for anyone who is interested in a resource, it's a cool podcast, Adam, out of the University of Pennsylvania. So I'll throw that out. Um, that's a lot to say. Thank you so much for being here. If you tune out, we're not upset. You've been here for an hour, but I just want to let you know that we're going to open it up for questions and we can always be reached from here on. So with that said, Amy, PSA for parents, you have the floor. What should their expectations be? Joe, I'm gonna take the lazy route and read you an email I wrote to our parents. <laughs> well, you're not a marketer. That's not the lazy route, that's innovative. <laughs> that's innovative. So I, uh, this was when distance learning was rolled out in our district. So I sent them the guidelines for distance learning and I said, here's the thing though, everyone, Education never was about grades and credits and letters on the transcript. It was about learning and growing and rising to our worth. My sincere and possibly naive hope is that regardless of the carrot we dangle in front of you, that we finish this year strong together. I reminded our staff today that hope is actually a better predictor of success as measured by career, relational, and personal fulfillment than GPA, SAT score, or achievement on standardized tests. Our primary role as educators right now is being your ambassadors of hope whether you've acquired your needed credits or not. So Grizzlies, we've got two months left together. We promise to make your learning meaningful, to laugh with you, possibly cry with you, to learn with you, and maybe even bring a little hope to this world. All we ask is that you stay connected. Just because the school building is closed for the year, and just because school is done for some of you seniors, doesn't mean that our year is over. If it is true that life begins at the end of our comfort zone, it's time that we lean into this crazy and show the world what Grizzlies are made of. 
that would be my, that was and would be, continue to be my public service announcement. Wow. Thank, thank you so much, Amy. Brad, what would you add or subtract? Uh, that, that was probably better than anything I can come up with on the spot. But, but I think, like I said before, you know, right now it's just about taking care of each other, making sure everybody's okay. Um, it's, it's more about grace um, than anything else. The students are still going to learn some. Some aren't at all. You know, they don't have the connections. They're not able to connect. And, and I understand that, you know, many parents are frustrated. A lot of the, the messages we hear and see is really frustration. It's just like, you know, Amy, when if she has a student, the parent comes in mad at a teacher or at her about some discipline issue, it's really probably frustration from them and, you know, being able to handle their child or whatever. So I understand there's a lot of, you know, anxious and stress at home. So I really think it's about just surviving it right now. And, and when we're able to come back in the fall, like I said, I really hope parents have a greater appreciation of what teachers do and we build that coalition. But I also think that um, right now is a great opportunity for teachers to really connect with the parents. A lot of times when we think about the students in the classroom, a lot of times their parents may not have had a great school experience. And that's one of the reasons they come with like this you know, prejudgment of school and teachers and things like that. So I think it's just a great opportunity for teachers to really connect on a personal level or a human level and not even as really an educator right now and let them see, you know, their students are probably sharing with them, you know, some of them miss their teachers and hopefully, you know, that the parents understand that the teachers are missing their child too and that they're really, it, it is a team effort to educate right now more than ever. If you have a, an icon at the bottom of your screen that says raise hand, go ahead and I'll, I'll unmute you and throw you in so you can hear, uh, Brad and Amy can hear your voice uh, in the home stretch here. Uh, Brad, back to you. Um, what can you tell us, if anything, about your uh, most recent upcoming project? Uh, well, Putting Teachers First has been out for a little while and it's been hugely successful. And it's really that whole servant mentality that we talked about with Amy of, if you take care of your teachers, you, you encourage them, support them and appreciate them, they're really going to do more than you ever dreamed of for the students in the classroom. Uh, and then uh, this fall, it's called Principal Boot Camp. I named it that because the, the turnover rate of principals is about as high as, as teachers now. Two to five years, most principals just don't last. They don't have time to build that culture that Amy's talking about. So I give them accelerated strategies to kind of help them, you know, move that timeline up. In the past, principals had years to develop culture. They don't have that now. So it's really strategies to help them. And then... I'm, I'm doing uh, a special project. It's an inspirational, affirmational book for teachers. It's going to be called Dear Teacher. And it's just, it's like an inspirational a day. It's a, a hundred um, quotes and, and anecdotes to encourage uh, and, and uh, a affirmation and inspiration for teachers. I'm going to go to Cruz next. And then uh, if, if Amy and Brad, if you have a book recommendation, this group loves book recommendations. Uh, something that you've read that, that struck you could be about education or outside of the world of education. Cruz, you're on. Hello, everybody. I'm so honored to be here with everyone. Um, I, as a family liaison, I mentioned that um, I, uh, I mentioned that I was a family liaison. I'm sorry. And um, I put out and created a YouTube channel for the families at my school and um, I sent out a message to, to the family saying that it was a very tough position for them to be put into as a teacher and just a matter of, um, in our district, a matter of moments actually. And I told them to do the best that they could with what they had. Um, and then I found that I was having to do that as a parent myself because I immediately went to try to help the other families that I serve at my school district 
and then realized that my daughter was um, giving herself probably an aneurysm in her bedroom as she was trying to get all her work done. And then I remembered what I had told my own families and then just implemented that and said, okay, you know, I don't, maybe don't have honors chem experience, but I'm just going to do the best I have, the best I can with what I have. And that's kind of how I've been living um, these past few weeks and just doing the best that I can and learning from as many people as I possibly can. Well, it's tough to build on that. I mean, Brad and Amy, that's, well, we'll go to you, Amy. That's got to be music to your ears, right? That's, that's the kind of message you're looking to throw out there. Oh, man. Yeah. I'm, I, I mean, I, I feel the same way. I'm, I feel like I'm utterly failing as a parent. So I'm, I'm, I always uh, struggle to put my educator hat on and talk to the parent, Amy, uh, because she needs to listen to what the educator, Amy, is saying, and she doesn't always. So um, I, I can totally empathize with that. And I think um, what, you're, what you're doing so right with that is um, by um, allowing your vulnerability to be transparent to those you're serving. And I think that's so crucial right now as we're leading staff and as we're leading parents. My weekly message to my staff is always some sort of self-deprecating story about what I'm struggling with um, because I think it does not only build community, but gives people permission to be real about what they're struggling with too, so we can kind of come together and help each other out. So I, I appreciate that, um, that story and it definitely resonates and I'd be lying if I said I had any of this figured out as a parent, um, but I think that's, that's, the, that's the role we're playing right now is we are, we are the ambassadors of hope for our communities and what that means is we, are, we pull back the curtain on what life is like for us too and we let people know that it's not just them, that even those who have their doctorate in education and know how to make a solid lesson plan can't even get, catch up their own daughter in her middle school classwork. So I think that's really important. Amy, I want to ask you about a book, and I want to preface it by saying, you know, we're going to give grace here. It, I've been reading less. I, I feel like um, I thought if I could have imagined a scenario like this, I'd be reading more because I'm at least in the home. But confession, I've been reading less. But is there a book that past or present you've read? It doesn't have to be a message about today. It could be a message that just you think a, a bunch of curious educators and parents would love. Sure thing. And I, I'm not necessarily finding the time to read, but as I'm getting dressed and putting on my makeup when I choose to for my Zoom meetings, um, I've been listening to a book on tape, or not tape anymore, what it would be, a book on audio, uh, Untamed by Glennon Doyle, which I'm finding to be very pertinent to life right now because we all have a chance to step back and um, look, kind of look at our lives from the outside in and figure out if we're if the way we've always been doing life is actually the way we want to continue doing life and the true to who we are. And I would recommend that for anyone who's um, in the middle of this pandemic, because I think it's now the perfect time to engage in that reading. Brad, what's uh, empty out your pockets here for books or a book you love? <laughs> Man, there, there's so many. I, I love leadership books. That's mainly what I write on. I've, I've been fortunate to interview a lot of really great leaders from business, military, the sports world over the years. Um, probably right now, I would say there's one that just came out by Chester Elton, who, who I mentioned earlier, and it's called Leading with Gratitude. And I think that's something that we can all uh, really focus on and, and hang on right now is, is the importance of, of gratitude, um, especially in leadership roles of, of being grateful for our staff of our people, the work they do, and, and showing them that type of gratitude. Mm. So it's called Leading with Gratitude by Chester Elton. Yeah, if you're not following Brad at Dr. Brad Johnson and Amy Fast at Fast Crayon, I do think uh, you're in for a treat because uh, this may be your first experience with them. Uh, Amy, final question for now, uh, and then I'll open it up for anyone who wants to stick around for a few more minutes. Um, what do you hope to take to your work in the, the next week or so? Like, is there something that you'll say, I'm gonna polish this up a little bit. I'd like to be just that much better at this. Yeah, um, I would say joy, first and foremost. I think um, that, I, like I said earlier, the, the hard part for me is I'm currently engaged in my least favorite parts of the job and really missing my favorite parts of the job, which are interactions with staff and students. So 
I'm going to do whatever I can to bring cultivate joy in the work and cultivate joy outside of the work because ultimately if we don't we're missing the mark. I think that's the whole purpose of education to begin with is giving students the skill set and the mindset to live a joyous and fulfilling life. So if I can't even do that as the person who's supposed to be leading this charge, then we're way off track. Brad, in a recent tweet, you say you can take the teacher out of school, but you can never take the school out of the teacher. Simple, elegant. What's your final message for people who have stuck around this long and, and just are looking for a little voice from you? Uh, just hang in there. <laughs> you know, and we hear it all the time. A lot of things become so cliche, but, you know, when we think about like this too shall pass, it, it really is. And I think we've seen I've been so impressed by what I've seen from teachers and heard from teachers all around the world, really, um, because they're all experiencing the same type of thing. And like I said, there's no test, there's no evaluation, but they're, they're making the best of a really bad situation and still giving it their all. You know, teachers are all about affirmation. I think that's the, the language most teachers speak. And they're just, a lot of them miss their students. Uh, and they're, they're really going above and beyond uh, what anybody would really expect. And a lot of them are really, uh, you know, not sleeping and stressed and not taking time for themselves. And so I would say that, you know, we know you're there. We know you're giving it your all. So take some time for yourself. Less is more, you know, be, um, you know, take care of yourself and your family and, and we'll get through this. And, and hopefully in the fall, you know, you'll be back in that classroom with your new set of children and, you know, think things will be great again. And with gratitude and with joy. Right. That's the goal. Absolutely. And uh, I want to thank you, Brad, for uh, investing your time and your expertise and your perspective. It's meant a lot to me and certainly the other people tonight. Thank you, Amy. Thank you so much. Uh, we spoke on episode 54. We'll do another episode someday, no doubt. But I want to tell you to hang in there, be a little bit more gracious to your own self, give yourself a little more grace. And by all means, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Joe, for having me. Uh, I'm a teacher. I'm, I'm finishing up my 21st year as a high school English teacher, public speaking and creative writing. When I'm not in the classroom, I, I love in, in interviewing wildly successful people like Amy and Brad, and quite frankly, like many of you. Uh, you can find the podcast at 1% Better. That's O-N-E, percent better. Please email me if you need anything, if I can help you in any way. Uh, with that, I want to end tonight's call. I'm going to hit stop on record, and then I'll let people unmute themselves if they want to have a little bit of conversation uh, with or without Brad and Amy. I know I have to go. Thank you so much.